Good morning, students of African Studies. Today, I want to give you some background information and explanations of the colonization of Africa, which is starting to come up in our readings of Homegoing. And I think first it's important to understand the time frame for this European activity in Africa, which is very different from what happened with the trade in enslaved Africans. That trade happened, you know, you can think about the um, emergence of the New World, the Americas, with Columbus, 1492. And very soon after that, they were bringing Africans to work um, in the Americas. So 1500s and then especially 1600s, 1700s, um, the trade in enslaved Africans is flourishing. And then uh, 1808, it's banned uh, by some countries and starts to decline at that point. So then we have this uh, fairly long period where there's less European involvement in Africa. And you get a sense of the time gap that happens between that and then colonization in Homegoing, uh, specifically on page 141 to 2. So this is in the Abina chapter, and she's remembering a night in her childhood. And she says that it was on a night like this that Papa Kwabina, one of the oldest men in their village, had started speaking about the slave trade. So here we have one of the oldest men in the village who can remember the slave trade. And he's telling a young Abina about this. And you can tell that it's a vague memory at this point. You know, he says, I had a cousin in the north who was stolen from his hut in the middle of the night, swoosh, just taken, and we don't know by whom. And then James says he was taken to the castle and they, they don't even know what the castle is there on Cape Coast. And he's explaining to them how the slave trade worked. And they nodded, Gyasi writes, though they did not know what a castle was, what America was. So we're now kind of in the late 1800s chronologically. And it's during that time when colonization is really um, coming to the fore. So then for your notes today on the colonization of Africa, the first things that you should write, maybe cite that page number in Homegoing. Uh, but then note that it's Zenith, the, the main period of it was from the mid 1800s to the early 1900s. And at the time it was referred to as the scramble for Africa. And it was formalized at a conference in Berlin that spanned two years, 1884 to 1885. And by formalized, I mean that the different imperial powers in Europe had for some decades just been going and grabbing various parts of Africa, staking claims, and it's, as you know, a huge continent. And for some time, they just worked independent of one another and there were no conflicts. But eventually, as they made more and more inroads into the country, they started bumping up against each other. Uh, sorry, more and more inroads into the continent, not the country. And so they held this conference in order to finally draw some lines and say, hey, we were here first. 
Um, this is the border of where our colony is and you can't cross it, etc. And it took, as you can imagine, a long time to work that out and draw these borders and come to these agreements. So that's why it, it spanned two years, this conference. Um, and again, how this was different from the slave trade is that the slave trade basically involved the Europeans making these outposts, these castles on the coast uh, of West Africa mainly, and using uh, African middlemen, as we have seen, to bring uh, enslaved Africans from the interior to the coast, and then they would take them in their ships to the New World. Here it's different. The European forces are really penetrating into the interior of Africa and um, staking claims uh, of, the, of the land. One of the participants in this conference um, referred to it as carving up this magnificent cake. This is a quote that sort of shows their attitude towards what they were doing. The main participants were England, France, Belgium, Portugal, Germany, and Italy. So two questions that I want to consider with you are why did colonization happen and how did it happen? So maybe have that as headings in your notes. For why, there were three main reasons. The first reason may surprise you, and that is really scientific inquiry. There were some uh, famous explorers during this time who wanted to have more knowledge of what was called then the dark continent, dark because it, from a European perspective, was rather shrouded in darkness. They didn't know much about it besides what they had seen um, of the coast, really, during the uh, slave trade period. Um, second was in order to civilize what they considered to be primitive peoples of Africa. And again, this is just their worldview. And that meant in part bringing Christianity to them, uh, proselytizing and converting, as we have started to see in homegoing. And also bringing health clinics, schools, social services, things that were considered to be part of European civilization. And finally, and this is really the imperialistic motive that we think of most commonly when we think about colonization, and that is to contribute to the glory, wealth, grandeur, of the home country that um, people were kind of working on behalf of when they went to Africa as part of this colonial initiative. Even though these three can be considered separately, it in fact was often the case that agents of uh, one of them worked hand in hand with agents of another, as we will see later on in the book. Now, as for the how, the people who study this talk about it in terms of three main thrusts into Africa. And it's a sort of violent term but it does reflect the fact that, again, they were penetrating into the interior of the continent as they had not before. So there was, on one hand, the religious or educational thrust often came first, as we have seen with the missionaries and homegoing. And then there was the political or governmental thrust. And then finally, there was the economic thrust.
And for the rest of today, I'm just going to talk to you about the first two, and then I'll treat the economic one separately later on. So again, in your notes, um, maybe a subtopic for the religious slash educational thrust of colonization. So again, as we have seen in home going, it was often the uh, priests, the ministers who came first uh, as part of this initiative. And uh, they were really trying to convert people from the traditional African religions, which for the most part, the Christian missionaries did not understand. Um, did not realize how complex and meaningful it was to the people who practiced them. And they set up schools to help carry out their mission. And in these schools, they taught the Africans who were interested, who would come to listen that the Europeans were coming to Africa to lift them out of barbarism. And so there was this kind of assumed superiority that was as a part of the message that was delivered. They also um, were not permissive of African languages, so they banned the use of African languages outright um, for those who would come to the school. And then you can imagine, as we saw in the instances of the trade in enslaved Africans, you have this room where you're vastly outnumbered by Africans and you're one white priest. And these people start speaking in a language that you can't understand, it could feel really threatening. And so they were just not allowed to use their native languages in the schools. Um, they also discouraged African customs and they ridiculed and suppressed African heritage. So for example, if you were to convert to Christianity, they gave you a European name and um, did not let you use your own original African name. So, you know, in the case of British missionaries, they would give these Africans names like um, Thomas or uh, Richard. Um, and that was a way to kind of create a separation between the Africans and their um, original uh, heritage and their, their roots in order to bring this new faith uh, into their lives. So um, that's the gist of the religious slash educational thrust. For the political slash governmental thrust, um, each colony had a different experience, but looking back and um, examining the documents and the records. The historians have divided um, <clears throat> what the different countries did into four different styles of rule. And for our purposes today, I'm just going to go into two of them and I'll touch on uh, the other two when we look more at um, the economic thrust. So the first was called indirect rule. And this was a form of governance that was preferred by the British. Um, they used it in Nigeria, for example, which is the site of uh, a book that I mentioned in our last online class, Things Fall Apart, a book that's often taught in this course that I highly recommend to you. It's fairly short, and if you're interested in um, African studies, it's the classic. It's the one that is taught the most um, and has been that way for decades. Um, in indirect rule, the native leaders, be they kings or headmen or chieftains, 
depending on the um, tribe, were invited or bribed or coerced into being part of the colonial administration. And there were benefits for them if they uh, decided to do this. And the British, for example, if there were no such leaders, created them. So in some places, and we see this in, in Nigeria amongst the Igbo or Igbo, I-B-O or I-G-B-O, it's sometimes spelled uh, amongst that people, uh, they did not have a hierarchical system. There were, you know, councils of elders, um, but uh, there was no single person that the British could rule through. So they created them. They created what were called warrant chiefs. And in any case, the warrant chiefs or the actual kings or chieftains and other tribes were uh, answerable to British district officers. That's capitalized district officers. And they... Um, received orders from these district officers and implemented them amongst their people. So that was indirect rule. The other form of political rule that I'll touch on just briefly today was called direct rule. And this was preferred by the Belgians in some cases, uh, the Portuguese, the Germans, and in direct rule, as the name implies, the colony was ruled directly from the home country. The capital, say Paris, would pass orders down to a white governor of a colony. So these governorships were plum positions. Uh, it was somewhat akin to being appointed an ambassador of a country today, although uh, different in that you were in charge of the colony. You ruled the colony as the governor. So these white governors would actually uh, pick up roots from France or Portugal or Germany and move their family and live in these colonies and rule them taking orders or in consultation with the home governments back in Europe. And in some cases, as was the case with the Portuguese, for example, the colony was actually annexed and made an official part of Portugal. So it was just considered to be like a district of the country that was located offshore on a different continent in this case. So that's how direct, direct rule could become. So um, that's all that I'm gonna give you today. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions about this material when we meet on Monday. Be well, and I'll talk to you soon.